Yes, welcome everyone. This is the Vanguard Show podcast, episode number 40, uh, sponsored by the book and photo exhibit from Old Guard to Vanguard. Uh, today we have a very special guest, Sukhan Chandan, a uh, documentary film director of uh, Insight to Riot, a rev revolutionary activist, journalist, writer with the London-based Malcolm X grassroots movement and the very uh, innovative and, and outstanding counter-narrative news that people could see on YouTube. So definitely check that out. He's also a uh, anti-colonialist, socialist, black power advocate who has been a global champion for over 30 years. And certainly it's an honor to uh, finally get a chance to speak with you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. How are you doing? Brother Malik, it's, come on, man, it's an honor for both of us. We're comrades, L long time in the struggle, yeah? Ab <laughs> so, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you for bringing me on. Just a, just a small corrective in case I get in trouble with some of the comrades there in the USA. It's the Malcolm X movement, not the Malcolm X grassroots movement, to which we're sympathetic and supportive of anyway. And we have some links to people from the MXGM in the USA. Um, but just a little corrective, it's the Malcolm X movement here based in London. Oh, okay. All right. You know, and I think we can get into uh, also the later on in the conversation about the British Black Panthers and the stateside uh, uh, Black Panther movement here. But since it's the uh, 98th birthday of the uh, commemoration of uh, Malcolm X, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, uh, which we uh, commemorated on uh, Friday, May 19th, tell me about uh, the influence of Malcolm had on you and others around you. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Um, first, salutations to the great martyr uh, that is Malcolm X, Malik al Haj Shabazz, and uh, solidarity and love to all of his comrades and family. Um, so, I mean, Malcolm X, it's, it's such a fascinating, multidimensional uh, figure of a human being that really personifies uh, really the one of the most radical movements, if not the most radical moment, sorry, of our liberation struggle of the last century. So he passes away in, in February 1965. And arguably 1968-69 is the high point of the global radical anti-colonial liberation movement, or as Malcolm X would define it in his message to the grassroots, the Black Revolution. And so I think what, why Malcolm is so, so profound for us, there's, there's, there's so many levels to it, but so just to explore just a few, just for, just for a minute, I think first of all, he, he helps to elevate the black liberation struggle in the United States, but in a way that is directly connected to the uh, so-called third world revolutionary struggles or the black revolution inspired partially out of the 1955 Bandung conference. Okay. Uh, as Mao would say, unite the many against the few, against the common uh, enemy. So he, he, he develops the, the, the black power struggle uh, for black liberation, not civil rights, as he made very clear, for human rights, because there is no equality within the colonial system. Right. So we have to be very clear, you cannot achieve equality within, within, within the colonial structure. So it's about smashing the colonial structure and then replacing it with a counter-colonial, uh, liberated uh, black republic or whatever you want to call it. That's, you know, um, people call it different things. So he links the struggle in the U.S. to the global struggle. He's obviously a very uh, a beautiful man in his physical stature, in his height, in the deep tone of his voice in his eloquence, which sees him rocket to the leadership of the Nation of Islam, which he joins uh, uh, shortly after leaving a stint in prison. Actually, I think it was, um, was it Wilfred, one of his brothers? Uh, yeah, they Wilfred. were encouraging him to join. Yeah, yes. mm -hmm. they were encouraging him to join the nation while he was still in prison. And so he starts a correspondence, if I'm not mistaken, with Elijah Muhammad while in prison. Right. And so, that's an interesting kind of trajectory, I think, for, 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 for Malcolm X or Malcolm Little as, uh, as his born name, because he comes, at, I mean, I'm I, you know all of this stuff, so forgive me, but he, he, he comes from a revolutionary black militant family. Oh, yeah. Both his mother and father are, are absolutely dedicated uh, to the black liberation struggle. He, his father is a Baptist minister in the UNIA movement of Marcus Garvey. If I'm not mistaken, his mother is of a Caribbean heritage as well. Yeah, that's um, I forget now which. Mm -hmm, that's yeah, correct. Which yeah. island? 
So like many other people in the black liberation struggle in the US and also the cultural struggle as well in terms of hip hop, DJ Cool Herc from Jamaica, um, many people are from the Caribbean islands and the Caribbean is, is, is globally important in, in, in all of this regards. So maybe we'll go into that a, a little bit uh, later. But so to finish off, so he combines all these things together, but then it's the way he self critiques through his loyalty to the radical grassroots, not only in the US, but globally. So 1959, he, he, he hangs out with, um, if, I, if I'm correct, in 59, he hangs out at the, um, at the uh, Teresa Hotel in Harlem with Fidel Castro. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. he's very keen to understand the Vietnamese resistance in Congo, in Egypt. I mean, arguably the Nation of Islam is like a proxy movement for Gamal Abdel Nasser in the, in, in, in the USA. And, and, and some scholars who are sympathetic to, to, to black liberation, I'm actually looking at the book over there. Um, let me get it one second. Okay, sure, sure. Sorry, I've got a library in front of me. Okay. I, I should have. And I have a book and paper for you to review as well. <laughs> yeah, no, nice one. Hold on a second. So, okay. so this one, it's a Black Nationalism by uh, Isi Udun, A Search for an Identity in America, which talks about the black Muslims and this is a, a newer edition. This is, I've got the original beautiful edition, but in this okay. he argues that, yeah, basically there's, there's, deep, there's deep ties to Gamal Abdel Nasser with Elijah Muhammad. Hmm. And, um, and so, uh, I, because, now, just to finish off the point, the Nation of Islam is a cult of Elijah Muhammad. It's his, it's his personal organization. And with that, it has a lot of limitations. Nevertheless, and Malcolm breaks away because Malcolm is not loyal narrowly to Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm is loyal to the global revolution against white supremacy, racism, colonialism. And so it, that enables him, he's more loyal to that than to Elijah. So he breaks away from Elijah, but what the nation of Islam does positively contru contribute in the ideological outlook and, and the practice of Malcolm X is a form of black internationalism. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the nation of Islam is not actually pan-Africanist as such, although it leans into that, Right. politics and that tradition it's actually black internationalist and louis farrakhan who is, is, is a problematic figure but until recently he, he argues against pan-africanism for a global blackness actually um so so that is interesting i'm not trying to put a a, a barrier between pan-africanism and black internationalism <laughs> not at all quite right. the counter opposite <laughs> however what i'm saying is that this enables malcolm x to have a much more sensitive and complex approach to racialize people, uniting them all in a black power movement. So he come, he travels the world and he relates to people of all African regions and of the, um, the African uh, Asian region of Arabia, the Middle East and into Asia and into African and Asian communities in the diaspora and the colonial center as all united as black comrades. He made no distinction between these different racialized groups and consider themselves all in the same trench of struggle, all in the black revolution. And that was very profound when he comes to England, but perhaps we can talk about that in a second. Okay, all right. Well, excellent. Uh, I, I was gonna say, there's always something that uh, moves a person toward consciousness and activism. Uh, for me, it certainly was Malcolm X, as you had uh, stated, uh, meeting uh, Stokely Carmichael, AKA Kwame Ture on the continent of Africa when I was uh, in my twenties, as a matter of fact. And, and certainly, uh, you know, Hugh P. Newton, Bobby Seale, uh, reading about them and even meeting uh, Bobby. What was the thing that got you in terms of, uh, you know, to go toward consciousness and activism personally? Yeah, I'll try to keep this short because these are, you know, these, you know, the, the stories we have to tell, you know, they're, oh, yeah. they're complicated and long, they're detailed, they're nuanced. So to try and sum it up very briefly, listen, I, I was born in India mm -hmm. uh, in 1978. I'm the fourth generation directly in my family of fighters against British colonialism. Mm -hmm. It starts with my great uncle on my father's side. Both my grandfathers are in the uh, are in the liberation struggle against British colonialism. My maternal grandfather is one of the first recruits of Gandhi in the early 20s, then joins the armed struggle subsequently. My paternal grandfather is, a, uh, is an anti-colonial communist organizer in both Punjab and also in, uh, in Kenya. And my father was born in Nairobi. My paternal grandfather was with uh, the Land and Freedom Party leadership and the Mau Mau. Okay. Uh, he, he helped to um, support Didn Kimati, the leader of the Mau Mau. Uh, in uh, 
directly. One of the few photos of Adina Kamati is taken by my paternal grandfather in his mm -hmm. uh, his studio in Nairobi. Uh, it was Adina Kamati. He shaved off. He shaved off his locks. He was underground. He wore a European suit with two other comrades. And so my 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 dadaji, my my paternal grandfather, was a safe house for many liberation fighters. There's one funny story. One one guy shot dead a British policeman and hid under the floorboards as a safe house in my paternal grandfather's house, but then got oh. drunk and was found by the British authorities totally in a drunken stupor in some hedge. Oh, so wow. he obviously lacks, mm. lacked a bit of revolutionary discipline or, you know, it's a bit stressful, you know, that those activities. So you need a bit of chill as well. I oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but don't get caught. Absolutely. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's true. <laughs> the main thing, get yeah. and run and don't get caught. But... Um, so then both my parents are involved in, 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 in radical communist leadership in Punjab. And that's what brings them together and produces me. And then they come to the colonial center in London. Um, and then, you know, you bring, you bring a child of a revolutionary family into the colonial center. Mm -hmm. I mean, things are going to happen. Something's right. going to happen. Right, right. And, that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of like so uh, bringing them in Reb Babylon, pretty much, uh, or I should say, uh, you know, the uh, the center of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, leader, one of the leaders in oppression around the world. And you can definitely radicalize the youth, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I call London the heart of whiteness. You know, mm. it's uh, it's one of the, like you say, it's one of the absolute colonial centers. So then in, so then I'm growing up uh, now. I had a relatively peaceful childhood in Southall, which is a which is a massive, in, massively important black community here, mostly of uh, Indians and Pakistanis. Now, in 1976, 1979, and 1981, Southall has uprisings against street racism and institutional racism. So I was saved a lot of grief, and I arrived just a few months after all those uprisings. And so my schooling, I didn't really have. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't remember any teacher being racist to me, um, because we fought back hard. You know, we fought back in Southall, and then a few miles down the road that way was the resistance in Notting Hill at the Notting Hill Carnival uh, in 1976, particularly, but also from 1959 when Kelso Cochran, the Antiguan brother, was killed in a racist attack, which then launched a whole bunch of black militant resistance in Notting Hill, Ladbroke Grove. So, you know, I'm sandwiched in these, between these two communities. So it allowed young people and children like me a, a relative semblance of kind of like a breathing space just to be children. Of course, we were still facing systemic racism in housing uh, and in other ways in our communities, but it was it was an okay existence. But so then I'm growing up in Southall, you know, music and culture is fundamentally important. So the, the song, my, my father, you know, he, he he's, his library is with, with Neruda and Ngugi and uh, and uh, uh, Angolan revolutionaries and you know it's 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 it's, it's African and Asian anti-colonial literature, politics, literature, poetry, culture, posters are adorning our inside of our home, and that has an effect on a child, you know, mm -hmm. growing yeah, up. So that was so, so I give thanks, you know, to, to my father's leadership in, in that regard. And then I'm hearing reggae, you know, mm -hmm. uh, my yes. father is is. is is blasting UB40 and Bob Marley and uh, musical youth. You know, oh, yes. Dutchie, One of my favorites. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And all these songs are like, it's social commentary, social yeah. critique, mm -hmm. political right. advocacy, you know, including Pastor Dutchie yeah. and including the hits of Bob Marley as well and UB40. UB40 come out of the black grassroots uh, in Birmingham, actually. Right. A lot of political songs that, that they're that they're doing and political struggle that they're involved in, so that must have had some influence on me. You know, at the age of six, seven, eight, nine, ten, then then ten, eleven, when you start to kind of trying to kind of push your kind of teenage, you know, you, you're te you approaching teenagehood, and then what happens? What's again? It's like it's Rebel MC who's called Congo Natty now, mm -hmm. who's working with Barrington Levy and other you know, reggae artists also espousing really kind of radical political messaging. Even Salt and Pepper, Push It, is like a big song, yeah. right? And it's like confident, sassy, uh, black young women, right? It's yeah. like, okay, and there's Free Papa Go Rappers and the Cookie Crew and, you know, um, and, and, and other people on my radar. And so, and then I'm like looking at the 
Caribbean black youth who are my friends in my class and we're playing football in the playground. I'm like, these guys are really confident, mm. you know? Mm. They don't take any shit from anyone. <laughs> and it's like, I I'm searching for like, who, who are the exciting people? Who are the exciting peers? Who are the people? Because I'm, I'm a risk taker naturally, you know? Right. Um, I want to do culture. I want to kind of, you know, be edgy. And so I, I remember now I was looking around, it's like, yeah, it's it's Roy and it's Daniel McPherson, like my, my friends, you know, uh, African-Caribbean friends. Right. Um, and I'm like, yeah, they're the best at football. They are the most defiant. They're the most interesting musically and culturally in terms of dress. So, you know, it's wallaby shoes, it's the African leather medallions, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The Malcolm X the Malcolm X film comes out in 91. So people are wearing Malcolm X hat. I remember the Ghetto Blasters still. Mm -hmm. And then N.W.A. comes out, right? Oh, yes. With their first album. Yes. Straight out of Compton. Mm -hmm. And then I sneak up, upstairs in my Sudanese friend's house to his big brother's bedroom. Mm -hmm. We've sneakily put on the N.W.A. tape, wow. right? Okay. Now, now, we don't understand the nuances of the problematics mm -hmm. of some of the stuff. But all we are hearing is a very defiant, like uh, an amazing kind of lots of swear words, which is exciting for a 11 year old. You know? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we didn't really understand the N word. Do you know what I mean? It, you know, but we didn't, that wasn't really on our radar, right? Radar. It was F, M, F. It was like, you know, it was like just assertiveness, just defiant, just like mm. brazen, fearless. And we're like, oh, wow, what right. is this? Right. You know, from, from Salt and Pepper, right? From Salt and Pepper, musical youth. Uh, a wee Papa Girl Rappers, Rebel MC, Nena Cherry, Buffalo Stance, to oh, yeah. NWA. Right. Whoa. This kind of was like a bit mind blowing And Public Enemy as well, right? right? Uh, yeah, Public public Enemy. But interestingly, it's more NWA that comes on our radar than Public Enemy. Mm, okay. But that's just coincidence. There's my Sudanese friend's older brother who had the tape, right? Okay. And so, and so, then I go to high school, and high school is a complex time for all of us. Yes. It's a very intense time. Absolutely. You know, but there's a lot. This is a period when, when communities are dividing off. So this is in the early 90s, right? Okay. We have the defeat of the, of, of the socialist bloc, which also is a big defeat of the radical movements in Africa, Asia, and Latin America as well. So my political timeline is, is, in, is in the period of dramatic defeats globally of our struggle. Mm. And that has a, 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 its repercussions directly in, in racialized oppressed communities in this country. Mm. So, so it's a complex, it's a contradictory phenomenon because musically and culturally youth are fusing together in, rave, in the sound system culture as it's manifest here, right? right? Coming out of reggae and reggae, the, the, the dance scene, the house scene, the rave scene produces uh, jungle techno, then jungleist drum and bass. It's a continuation mm. of Jamaican sound system culture in that form. Right. And so that brings the youth together, but politically the youth are coming apart. So there's two contradictory movements at the same time. So I get into hip hop, I also get into rock and punk, but by my late to mid teens, I get into jungle drum and bass and house and garage and I become an MC in 96. Now, just before that, uh, similar to you, Malik, mm -hmm. Malcolm X and the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. These are the two things that I find through music. So big art P-Dog from Paris. I've got to give a massive salutation to P-Dog from Paris okay. because public enemy, yes, but P-Dog with his first and second album, it's overtly Panther power all okay. over it right you know and and then there's another uh there's a there's a black and asian dance group here called fundamental who on their record sleeve uh, 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 on the record called seize the time mm -hmm. referencing bobby seal, bobby seal. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. it's got on the record sleeve it's explaining what cointel pro was in relation to the black panther party wow so i'm reading this at the age of 15 like wow what is this stuff amazing music these are asian and black youth you know in England, talking about Seize the Time, Cointel Pro, Black Panther Party, you know, Malcolm X with P-Dog and Public Enemy. I'm like, this is talking to me directly, you know? Mm, yeah. And so by the age of 15, I, 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 I end up doing my first political actions. And there's two things that I'm, I'm involved in initiating, two or three things. One 
is a police patrol against the police mm. on Southall Broadway during the Eid celebrations at the end, at the end, of, end of Ramadan, Ramzan. Mm. So I'm monitoring the police at the age of 15. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> okay, you're in it. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm campaigning against the disproportionate expulsion, racist expulsion of black youth from high schools mm. in my borough in West London. And I'm mobilizing around that in my college, mm. forming a student's union in defense of a black student who's being uh, discriminated and thrown out of his course unjustly. So, yeah, so it's just to answer your question. So, so that that is the main story that brings me to the age of around 16, 17 years old. Okay. Wow, that's excellent. Uh, you know, I, as I told you before we went on, I've been following you for quite a long time. Uh, and I'm so impressed with your counter narrative news. Uh, certainly, you being a documentary, documentary filmmaker, uh, as well as uh, your involvement with the uh, Malcolm X organization. Tell me about uh, both those entities, the Counter Narrative News and the Malcolm X movement uh, there. Right, so we're skipping more than 20 years, right? Of okay. My story, right? So we're going 16, 17, and then we're jumping, you know, 20 years onwards. So maybe we'll talk about the 20 years intermediary. Later okay, yeah, we can go back to it, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So, okay, so it's the Malcolm X movement Okay, I'm just going to just, from, from 2003 until 2015, I'm involved in different political initiatives and struggles and movements, not least Chelele Chelele Youth Brigades, which is a significant anti-imperialist uh, student and youth movement here in the early 2000s, in the period of 9-11, Af Afghan war, Iraq war, Palestinian intifada, uh, solidarity with Chavez, um, and the land seizures in Zimbabwe, defending Congo against the neo-colonial kind of uh, uh, war there by proxy, et cetera, active in all of these things. Chelela is very significant. Anyway, that aside, Chelela ends in 2004. I have my first child in 2005. So I'm kind of focused on just focusing on a, a little Amaru who's now 17 years old and he's a wonderful young man himself. Um, Man. He's making his own contributions in his own way. Yeah. But then I formed Sons of Malcolm, you might remember, my, mm -hmm. my website and my platform in 2007. Mm -hmm. So Sons of Malcolm is just my personal blog, but then it becomes like a network because it attracts uh, a group of activists that were campaigning on Palestine and other things. I host Emery Douglas and Billy X Jennings. Yes, I remember big, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Billy X is a big mentor of mine as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah, great. But Billy's a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful man. Uh, long life to both of those comrades. Wonderful people. And so, so in November, I think it was in November two thousand and eight. I host Billy and Emery, and also uh, Miris Gabriel, uh, Emery's daughter as well, who, who came over as well. It's nice and big up Miris as well. And. So we organized conferences together with Linton Crazy Johnson in Brixton with the Brixton Panthers and the Olive Morris Collective over there. Uh, lots of things, it was a great, it was a great, great moment. It was really, I really, really value that time. And so doing events with Sons of Malcolm, hosting Aaron Dixon as well, okay. um, around circa 2012. There's many things I've forgotten, lots of things that we did, lots of campaigns and stuff. Uh, it was significant contribution to the radical grassroots, the, the Sons of Malcolm ne network. But that was around, that was tied around me personally. So 2015 was coming up. 2015 was the 50th martyrdom anniversary of Malcolm X. Right. So I was like, from 2012, I was thinking 2015 is coming up. We've got to build towards that and do something significant. You know, 50 years, it's not, it's, you know, it doesn't come around, you know, yeah, that's right. <laughs> very, yeah. very much. Mm -hmm. so, so then I start networking with, with different networks and comrades and a couple of dozen of us are working to build the launch of the Malcolm X movement from 2012, mm. right? Okay. Our first event of the Malcolm X movement, it's on YouTube on our YouTube channel. I, I direct people to um, the Malcolm X movement YouTube channel, which is called Strike the Empire Back on June, June, 2014 is our first public manifestation, but we launch in the spring of 2015, okay. right? In time for Malcolm's actual uh, death or martyrdom anniversary. But, but Malik, you have to understand again, 2014, going through to 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 
is a period again of dramatic historical defeats for our struggle in this country. Okay. So in 2014, there's the referendum for Scottish independence, which the UK colonial state wins. Okay. Okay. Now that is a significant victory in a far right trajectory of the Tory state. Let's not forget as well, 2011, very significant year, Libya is destroyed, mm. led in an operation by Britain and France. Libya is a very significant state for the radical third world black liberation struggle across the world. 41 years of a socialist state disproportionately advocating and supporting black liberation and anti-imperialist radical movements, including armed struggles, including an island with the Irish Republican army. Um, that's destroyed in 2011. It's not opposed by the anti-war movement, really. Actually, many people, because of the confusion of the Arab Spring, which I call the Arab Sting at the time, they end up either being inactive or supportive, de facto, of the NATO operation, which is defined by mass violent anti-Black lynchings of the NATO proxies in Libya, okay. right? This is devastating. As Malcolm said, you can't understand what's happening in Mississippi Unless you, happen, uh, unless you understand what's happening in Congo. Mm -hmm. And both things have a, uh, interrelate directly. If Africa is defeated, we're defeated in the right. diaspora in the West. Mm -hmm. Libya is defeated. That whole, and, and don't forget, uh, what's his, uh, uh, Malcolm uh, Shabazz, mm -hmm. Malcolm X's grandson, meets Muammar Gaddafi in February 2011. Mm -hmm. Gaddafi is saying, I will support you um, I will support you in your uh, in your efforts globally. That's the black resistance. Anyway, so Libya is destroyed. Then we have an uprising in August 2011 after Mark Duggan is shot dead, young black man on the Broadwater Farm Estate, which is a center of black resistance in this country. That sparks four day uprising. Anyway, those two things are the uprising as well is a defeat. It's it's an uprising, which is which is which is a, 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 a important positive resistance, but 5,000 people go to jail and no leftist conduct defense campaigns, mm. right? So that is devastating to the grassroots. So 2014, the, Scot the Scottish referendum is, referendum is defeated. 2017, Brexit victory. Uh, 2017 also, the Grenfell disaster, which is basically an institutional massacre of our people at the Grenfell Tower. Mm. Then the hostile environment uh, immigration policies attacking the, the, the Jamaican migrants of the Windrush generation. So it's defeat, 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 defeat without any real resistance, okay? So the Malcolm X movement forges ahead dozens of event, events, engaging countless thousands of youths, engaging some really important historic direct actions, um, two of which significantly, but it's, it's, it's still a period of division, defeat. And that impacts the Malcolm X movement as well. So, but anyway, so just wanted to give a kind of outline of that. But the MXM gave a lot of leadership and continues to give leadership. Actually, we're kind of having a, a kind of a Malcolm X movement spring at the moment. We're having okay. such effective mass work and events at the moment. Uh, yeah. We're really giving leadership with, with our connected network. So it's, a, it's still an ongoing, very interesting and inspiring story that, that we're writing. Okay. And, and we do have about eight minutes, too, because I have a timed uh, uh, program. So I want to talk about the book that you did uh, on Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, please mention that and uh, where people can get it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's on Amazon. You can find it. It's called The Martyrdom of Muammar Gaddafi. I'll just grab a copy. Sorry. Sure. And show everyone. Uh, where is it? It's over here. Sorry, Malik. Oh, it's okay. I have this prepared. All right. So okay. that's, that's the book there. Um, it's endorsed by Saif al-Islam Gaddafi. It was his first public statement after the, the war in 2011. Listen, this is just basically, it's, to, it's just to give respect to, to, to Marama Gaddafi and what happened in Libya at the time. There's some things that I don't, you know, I, I would problematize a little bit now, but it's a significant document. It brings together a lot of the global voices in solidarity with Libya and understanding um, like all things, it's, it's contradictory in this problematic sides, but the contribution of the Jamaria, of the Mataba, of Marma Gaddafi himself. Um, so it kind of outlines uh, a few things. So I'd, I'd recommend this. And, and also there's a related documentary I did because I went there three times uh, to Libya during the NATO operation, standing in solidarity with uh, uh, Africa and the Libyan people. Um, so there's a documentary called NATO War in Libya as well, 
which you can find and you can contact me. So yeah, I, I thank you for, for mentioning that. Oh, uh, I wasn't going to mention that actually. So, so yeah. thanks. So that was just, you know, it was just, it was an act of solidarity with the Libyan community mm -hmm. and um, for, for the devastation and the sacrifice that, that, that was imposed upon them and to give thanks and respect really. Okay. And also I'd like to talk about some of your, uh, your black power connections. Uh, I mean, with uh, Darius Howe, uh, sister, uh, Comrade Khalid, uh, Layla Khalid, uh, talk about some of the history and the connections you've made with them. Brother, listen, most of our work in some senses is to just to be loyal to mm. those that have come before us right. and to connect with them the best we can, to learn from their experiences and knowledge and to, to deposit that into our struggle and to the newer generations. Mm. We walk with the martyrs, we walk with the ancestors. They have shown us the path that we continue to tread. So yeah, it's been a great honor to work with people like Leila Khalid, great salutations to, uh, to her. Darkus Howe, who passed away, was at the Malcolm X Movement event. I was chairing it at the Black Cultural Archives with her, his comrade and, and partner, Leila Howe. Um, significant uh, uh, people you mentioned before the Olive Morris Collective, Olive, Olive Morris with Brixton Panther, Linton Quasi with the, in the room with Emery Douglas that we helped to facilitate. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this countless names, you know, there's Adil Samara salutations on the occupied West Bank, one of the greatest Palestinian revolutionary intellectuals, Saib Shah, uh, leadership from Gaza, who's in, who's in Belfast currently that we work closely with. Um, there's Bob Brown of the, of the All African People's Revolutionary mm -hmm. Party General mm -hmm. Command. Salutations mm -hmm. to, to Bob. He's a great man. Oh, uh, lots yeah, to absolutely. learn from him. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of one of our political fathers, as he always calls us, um, and we're his sons. Um, so I mean, there's many, many, many others. I mean, even my father is is, is a significant person, and the connections around the, the Indian and the Pakistani uh, revolutionaries. George Shire from ZANU. Uh, a former liberation fighter and, and a decolonial black Marxist, significant figure, Eric Huntley, who, who lives on my road from the Walter Rodney Bookshop, Bogolovich or uh, publications with his uh, 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 departed uh, uh, wife, Jessica Huntley, who passed away 10 years ago. I mean, it's, it's you know, a Professor Gus John as well, who was of Grenadian heritage as well, a significant uh, fighter for six decades who we're still working with. It just it goes on and on and on. And, you know, people are starting to pass away. So it's really important that we're efficient in our work to work with them, to give thanks and honor and to connect their experience and their, their persons themselves with young people. I'm so proud that the Malcolm X movement is really doing, you know, really great work in that regards. And we've got teenagers working with these comrades, meeting them, that's informing that outlook increasingly. It's it's a beautiful story, you know. You know, our struggle has to be joyous. Oh, yes, you know, can't, you know, people aren't going to join our struggle if it's depressing and it's just mm. uh, you know it's negative. Sure. It has to be joyous. It has to be uplifting. It has to be liberating. Okay. Well, we got about three minutes left. I want to see if I can get your information that we can share with the uh, public as well as what's next for you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd reference us, you know, you be in touch with myself, you know, I, I'm on, my personally on Facebook, Malcolm X Movement is on Instagram, uh, Twitter, um, uh, Facebook, um, we've got YouTube channel, there's counter narrative news as well on YouTube, which is like, it's, which is like our news, uh, news and analysis and historical research and cultural arm, basically, as well. So that's going really well, um, as well. So what's next, uh, Malik, is just to continue taking the leadership the best we can. We've got a national campaign around racism in education coming up. Uh, we've got lots of events. We've got sound system uh, events coming up, celebrating the histories, interge intergenerational histories of sound system culture, you know, continuing campaigns against racist policing. Uh, we are working at the grassroots of mass work, developing community gardens, uh, projects for children, youths, uh, elderly. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a really, you know, complex and kind of diverse kind of uh, approach to, to strategic Black resistance and Black power socialist radical struggle, and really encourage people to get to get to get involved uh, on wh whatever you have to contribute. Um, there's so much more to be said, um, but really thanks for this time. Oh, absolutely. To, um, it's, I've been watching your programs, and, and and thank you, Malik, for the work that you're doing as well. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. You're you're a real stalwart, you know, and it's uh, and you're also a really decent, lovely human being. Oh, Which thank you. Very, Sometimes my wife might weird. differ the thing, but yes, I think. I, <laughs> but thank you, thank you. They know the truth. <laughs> Our women know the truth, you know. But you know, but <laughs> respect to the sisters as well. You know, thank you. you know, black, you know the black sisters as well. They, they need to be in the leadership. Uh, they understand oppression 
and how to do the work, you know, uh, better than some of some of us brothers as well. So, so, so respect to them. But th thank you, Malik, for this time. It's been a real, real pleasure. Well, it's, it's my honor. And they're going to have to be a part two, because I think we have a lot to unpack uh, later on down the road. Because I want to definitely invite you for, a, a, you know, pretty much a part two interview. Uh, but I wish you all yeah, the best. Yes, absolutely. All the best. And I hope to get out there pretty soon uh, uh, to uh, see Humble. you and the comrades. Humble. Humble. Thank you so much. Brother. Yeah, it'd be great to have you here. We'll put, we'll put some events on. We'll have some great times. We'll make some great connections. Pick it up, brother. Really, really appreciate, really appreciate that, appreciate brother. All, all power to the people. Thank you. Appreciate you. All power to the people. All Thank power you. to the people. Thank you.